Thankful for for though. I like hearing testimonies and uh, this uplifts you to hear what God's done in somebody else's life, doesn't it? I was going to tell you something. Uh, uh, all y'all was here this morning, wasn't you? No, Ken wasn't here. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, uh, when God gave me uh, what to preach this morning through those pages being torn out of my Bible, and he said, you can't leave this out. Uh, what I didn't know is he gave it to me last night. Didn't think no my, uh, mind of it. After J.D. come, and he, we watched the U.K. game last night. And when he left, uh, I got the Bible out that's over at the house. I got it out, read a little bit, you know. And uh, still didn't know what I was going to preach. While I was reading, there was a torn piece of the Bible fell out of the Bible. And I just put it back in. Well... After service this morning, I walked over to the house. I said, you don't reckon. And I opened that Bible and found that torn page, and it was the same thing. I mean, right at the end of the opening scripture that I used was where the tire was. He was telling me that last night. And you think of that. We can't leave that out. We can't leave unity out of the equation. It can't happen. Uh, we need each other. We need each other. But anyway, we'll continue our verse by verse Bible study. And understanding more about what we're talking about tonight uh, really gives you the ability to uh, be more unified and to love one another more. We've uh, went over. I think 1 through 6. We'll read uh, 1 Timothy chapter 1. We'll read 4 through... Uh, we'll read 4 through 9. Lord, well, we won't go through a whole lot, but that, that'll be enough for tonight. First Timothy chapter one, four through nine. I know we've already went through uh, verse six or seven, but there's so much in that it's hard to get it all in in a thirty-minute Bible study. But First Timothy chapter one, four through nine. Everybody there. Uh, you don't have to stand. We'll go ahead and read. Neither give heed to fables and endless genealogies, which minister questions rather than godly edifying, which is in faith, so do. Now the end of the commandment is charity out of a pure heart and of a good conscience and of faith unfeigned, from which some, having swerved, had turned aside into vain jangling, desiring to be teachers of the law, understanding neither what they say nor where they affirm. But we know that the law is good if a man use it lawfully. Knowing this, that the law is not made for a righteous man, but for the lawless and disobedient, for the ungodly and for sinners, for unholy, profane, for murderers of fathers, murderers uh, of mo mothers, for manslayers. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, God, we just come before you today. God, so thankful, God, for everything that you have done for us. And God, we don't know a fraction of what you've done for us. But nonetheless, we're thankful. So thankful that you take care of us. And God, we're thankful that you give us the ability to become your children through Jesus Christ. And God, I, we're thankful for this church that you have established here at Sydney and you have put us in it. And God, we just desire to learn more about you tonight. We desire for you to change us. We desire for you to mold us more into the image of your son. And God, we say, use us. Use us for your kingdom. Give us the ability to further your gospel. God, because we're not able to do nothing on our own. But you do it through us. And God, whatever you do tonight and whatever you do in our little bitty church here, 
at Sydney, Kentucky. Remind us to give you all the praise and honor and glory for it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 We'll kind of summarize what we went over last time. Uh, we see here in verse 4 it says, Neither give uh, heed to fables and the end of uh, genealogies which minister questions rather than godly edifying, which is in faith. Uh, I asked this question last time, but anyone in here uh, ever raised up under a uh, um, legalistic uh, doctrine? Hasn't always understood eternal security. Well, I know Sean. Uh, you never find any answers to any questions when you don't understand eternal security. Everything other than faith in the finished work of Christ is just going to put more questions in your life. You're never going to figure nothing out. When you think you've learned something, it just added 20 more questions uh, that you can't figure out. Nothing makes sense until you understand the true doctrine. I couldn't even understand that. I couldn't even understand that what I understood was nonsense until I understood the truth, if that makes sense. I don't know if that makes sense to you or not. But you have to have the true gospel uh, of faith in the finished work of Jesus Christ, period. Once you get that, uh, the questions that you may have, you can find the answer to because they're there, because it starts to make sense. The whole Word of God begins to open up. You thought it was just a book, and now you see that it's alive. And it's breathing. And it's talking to you. It's Jesus Christ. He's right there in your hands. You're, you're reading about Him. You're fellowshipping with Him. And you can't see that until you understand what He did. What He actually did on the cross. But uh, that's how I like to sum that verse up. is The questions. You never get a question answered. Period. Uh, but in verse 5 we see, uh, talk about uh, the end of the commandment. is charity out of a pure heart and out of a good conscience and a faith unfeigned. We use the example of when God says we'll make man in our own image. Uh, God's a trinity. He made us a trinity. Uh, spirit, soul, and body. And this verse is in uh, reverse because it says the end of the commandment. Uh, the end of the commandment is the fulfilling of the law. Uh, that's the end of it. It's finished. If you look at this ver uh, uh, verse in reverse, you see how that the law is accomplished uh, or fulfilled in your life. Uh, or you can get to the point where you are walking according to God's righteous standard. And it begins with uh, faith uh, unfeigned. That's not, unfeigned means it's not a, a make-believe faith. It's a real faith. It's not a fake faith. It's not a, a, a faith by talk. It's a faith by walk. Uh, but once you have faith unfeigned, which comes from your spirit. When you got saved, your spirit was completely perfected. There's a third of you that is perfect no matter what you do with your Christian life. Your spirit. It has been sealed by the Holy Spirit. Uh, bad can't get in and good can't get out of it. it. It's perfect. Your spirit is. And through that spirit relationship that you have with God, which is a spirit, uh, uh, you develop faith. Uh, uh, faith uh, uh, come by hearing, hearing by the Word. As you're injecting the Word, uh, you're feeding uh, your ability for that spirit to the end. What does it say next in that verse? Uh, or in reverse. Faith unfeigned and a good conscience. We talked about how everybody has a conscience but it might not be good. It might be good but you develop that through your life experiences through your upbringing, through your influences. Once that spirit or that faith unfeigned begins to uh, affect your conscience which is your soul your mind, will and emotions uh, uh, what you're thinking uh, all that stuff. Once uh, the faith begins to influence uh, your soul you begin to have a good conscience and then from the good conscious you now have a pure heart because your heart is part of your soul and then what comes out of the heart charity love and then once you love the love's uh, the loss fulfilled in one word love so this uh, uh, verse right here verse 5 in reverse shows you the correct order to be like God 
to think like Him, to act like Him, to love like Him. He wants us uh, in the image of His only begotten Son, Christ. He wants us to be like Him. Matter of fact, what Jean Ann said earlier, what He started, uh, He's going to finish. That's exactly what He's going to finish in you. You're going to be, uh, Christ is going to glorify Himself in, in, in uh, uh, the body of believers, the Christians, the saints. We're going to be made like unto Him because we'll see Him as He is. And that verse uh, in reverse shows how that happens. Uh, now in verse uh, 6 we see, From which some, having swerved, have turned aside unto vain jangling. That uh, word uh, jangling means uh, bickering, uh, complaining. Uh, this, uh, For instance, a church that fights all the time. What has happened is they forgot the correct gospel. They forgot the correct doctrine. They may, well, anytime this church, and you guys have seen this church bicker and complain with one another, it wasn't that we didn't believe in eternal security, we just forgot. Just because you know something don't mean you ain't living it. Sometimes you've got to know something, then God's got to work something in you. Uh, you could say you believe this all you want to, but it's got to be unfeigned. It has to be real, not fake. Anytime that a church is bickering, and complaining, somewhere down the line, somebody has left the true gospel of Jesus Christ, and they have put works in there somewhere. They, they, somebody's become legalistic, and this caused the problem. Take it to the bank every time, every time, because if every member of a local body is functioning by faith in the finished work of Jesus Christ, then we're going to be knit together in love and you won't be falling apart from the inside out. Amen. And then, once we get to the point where we can stick together, ain't nothing going to separate us. When we get to the point where it doesn't matter what, what happens between me and Sean, he punched me in the face, I still love him. It doesn't matter what he sees out of me. He can see me act like a fool, but he still loves me. Once we get to that point, then God can use us out there. But he can't use us out there if we can't love one another in here. See what I mean? And it had, the only way that is accomplished is through the true gospel, uh, through true doctrine, because a false doctrine leads to vain jangling. It's vain. It's pointless. Uh, anyway, I know we're refreshing. We'll keep going. Uh, verse 7. It's right here. We'll go ahead and read 7 today. Desiring to be teachers of the law, understanding neither what they say nor where they affirm. I'll go ahead and tell you, the more that I learn, now the more I learn, the more dumb I realize I am, if that makes sense. But the more I learn, the more I realize there's a lot of preachers out there that don't know what they're talking about. And it breaks my heart, you know what I mean? And I don't, you know, I have compassion on them because I used to think like they had, like they did. Matter of fact, I was called to preach when I was 17. And I preached one sermon when I, when I was 17. And I preached false doctrine. So how can I be mad at them? You know what I mean? They need the truth revealed to them. Uh, but somewhere down the line, somebody has forgot. And the best that I can figure, and this is my opinion, but you've got what's called the, the greatest generation uh, in American history uh, during World War II, World War II era. Man, them people worked. They could get stuff done. Uh, they were successful. They made things happen. They trusted God. But then you see in the 60s, it just seems like the greatest rebellion against God ever happened. And our country's been in a downhill spiral ever since. What happened? I think what happened, this is my opinion, is the greatest generation got so great and God was blessing them so much, they ended up like Israel when God called them Yeshua. And I think somewhere down the line, somebody forgot grace and they thought they was being, and I could be wrong, but this has to be what happened. They thought they were successful and so great because of what they did. Because when that happens, and we're going to get into that right here in just a second, because the law is the strength of sin. I believe that we tried to force God on everybody, and it caused a rebellion. And you see that rebellion in the 60s, and you still see that rebellion today, but I think we're on our way back on the uphill side. I really believe that. I believe America's got another revival in them. And I believe we're on the verge of it. That's what I'm praying for, revival in America. We need it. We need it. But anyway... That was just opinion. I didn't read that from Philippians or nowhere. 
But that's what happens uh, when we get away from the true doctrine. It causes confusion. But in verse 7 and 8 it says, Desiring to be teachers of the law, understanding neither what they say nor where they affirm. But we know that the law is good if a man use it lawfully. I'm going to read uh, from Romans 7 here. You can turn there if you want. Or I'll just read it to you. I'm going to read from Romans 5 too. But... And I know most of you guys probably know this, but... I'm telling you, it's good to refresh yourself on the purpose of the law. Because if you forget its purpose and you begin to try to use the law now, it will cause you problems. It will cause you problems. The law is not for our use. There, there's no time ever in our life where we should look to the law for a result, period. Uh, you can use the law lawfully, uh, correctly. We'll get into that in just a second. But I'm going to read Romans chapter 7, uh, 7 through 14. It says, What shall we say then? Is the law, uh, is the law sin? God forbid. Nay, I had not known sin, but by the law. For I had not known uh, lust, except the law had said, Thou shalt not covet. But sin, taking occasion by the commandment, wrought in me all manner of concupiscence. For without the law, sin was dead. But I was alive without the law once. But when the commandment came, sin revived and I, and I died. A good example is uh, Adam and Eve in the garden. They were completely innocent, even though they were naked. Until they knew right from wrong. And then they sinned. They were naked. They're seen their nakedness. That's what Paul's saying here. He said, I, I didn't know sin until I knew sin. Adam and Eve didn't know they were naked until they knew they were naked. And they weren't held accountable for their nakedness until they knew it was wrong. And Paul's saying here, when the law comes, sin revived and died. It wasn't that the law was bad. It wasn't that the law was unspiritual. Uh, matter of fact, the law is actually God's righteous standard. It's always been God's righteous standard. Good, uh, right and wrong, good and evil, it's been the same from the beginning. Uh, but when we don't know right from wrong, uh, we don't have no sin because we're ignorant to it. Uh, but nonetheless, Paul said here, when the law came, before the law came, I was alive. But once it came, uh, sin revived and I died. Verse 10 says, and the commandment which was ordained to life, I found to be unto death. It goes on to say, for sin taking occasion by the commandment deceived me, and by it slew me. Wherefore the law is holy, and the commandment holy, and just, and good. Was then that which is good made death unto me, God forbid. But sin, that it might appear sin, working death in me by that which is good, that sin by the commandment might become exceeding sinful. For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am carnal, sold under sin. The problem with the law is we're carnal. There's nothing wrong with the law. There's nothing bad about the law. But it is your enemy. You can't keep it. You can't keep it. Um, we'll turn to Romans chapter 5, if you will, or I can just read it to you. You don't have to turn there. But I'm going to read verse 20 and 21. It says, Moreover, the law uh, entered that the offense might abound. But where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. That as sin has reigned unto death, even so might grace reign through righteousness unto eternal life by Jesus Christ our Lord. The law could never, ever, ever save you because of you. Not because of the law, but because of the sin nature that you had that came all the way back from Genesis, from Adam. We inherited that sin nature. We couldn't keep the law. The law was good, and it was spiritual, but we're carnal. And the law couldn't save us, but grace can. So imagine, why would we ever want to go back to the law? I'm going to turn to Galatians chapter 3, and we'll see the, the full purpose of the law. Because it had purpose. Galatians chapter 3. 
Now keep in mind we're talking about uh, people ministering false doctrine because they, they don't understand what the law is for. They don't, they don't understand the law. They try to live by it. Galatians chapter 3, I'm going to read 19 through 29 if you guys don't care. It says, Wherefore then serveth the law? It was added because of transgressions till the seed should come to whom the promise was made. And it was ordained by angels in the hand of a mediator. Right there explains the purpose of it. Period. We're going to read all the way through 29. But the law was given because of transgression, uh, transgression till the seed should come. It was, uh, well, you'll read here in a minute, it was our schoolmaster. If we didn't have the law, we wouldn't understand that we needed the seed when the seed would come which was Jesus Christ. We wouldn't understand that we needed Him. Uh, and we do need Him. Uh, goes on to say, Now a mediator is not a mediator of one, but God is one. Is the law then against the promises of God? God forbid. For if there had been a law given which could have given life, uh, verily righteousness should have been by the law. But the Scripture hath concluded all under sin that the promise by faith of Jesus Christ might be given to them that believe. But before faith came, we were kept under the law, shut up uh, unto the faith which should afterwards be revealed. Wherefore the law was our schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ that we might be justified by faith. If we did not have the law, we could never be brought to Christ because we would not understand our need for a Savior. But when you look at the law, if you're looking at it correctly, you see that it is an impossible task that has been placed before you, and then you'll look for an alternate way to be saved because it can't save you. It's your schoolmaster. When the problem with self-righteousness is people look at the law and for some reason they think they've fulfilled it. And that don't make a bit of sense to me. And the problem is they're not rightly dividing the word because if they understood the law the least little bit, they would understand to be justified by it. You'd have to keep every jot and tittle of it. And you run that after about at least a month or two uh, uh, from being born. You're going to do something wrong. And by the way, you was born with a sin nature. In your mother's womb, you had a sin nature. The law was already broken in your life. Anyway, where was we at here? Wherefore the law was our schoolmaster to bring us into Christ that we might be justified by faith. But after that faith has come, we are no longer under a schoolmaster. For ye are all the children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. For as many of you have been baptized into Christ, have put on Christ. That's not water baptism. That is a uh, uh, identifying with Him. You identify with, uh, with Him through the imputation of the Holy Spirit. Like I said earlier, the spirit part of you is absolutely perfect because it's all of Christ's righteousness in there. It's every accomplishment that He accomplished. It's His death. It's His burial. It's His quickening. It's His resurrection. Uh, all bundled up for you in a trophy that God has placed in your spirit and sealed it in there with the, with the Holy Spirit of promise. It can't come out and nothing can go in and defile it. You are a third perfect already from the day you believe. And that's enough to get you to heaven, despite what anybody else says. But anyway, it goes on to say, uh, For all are children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. For as many of you have been baptized into Christ, have put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither bond nor free. There is neither male nor female. For ye are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you be Christ, then are ye Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. Now you remember when Abraham asked God, How do I know that all this is going to happen, that you said it's going to happen? And God told Abraham to take uh, 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 sacrificial animals and, uh, and cut them all in half. And then uh, according to uh, custom and what people did then, if they was going to make a covenant with somebody, they would walk in between uh, those uh, torn sacrifices to symbolize uh, uh, what they would do uh, to keep the covenant. Well, that's when God caused a sleep to come over Abraham, and all of a sudden there was a fire going up and down between uh, uh, those sacrifices. And what that was, God saying, you go over and take a red, 
this, this covenant is going to be on me. It's depending upon what I do and not what you do. Therefore, that's why it's called a promise. A promise, God can't lie. He's going to keep a promise. Amen. The law does not void the, the Abraham covenant that was made that was dependent upon what God would do. But the law was put there so that transgression could be seen and keep people in check until the Redeemer would come. And now once the Redeemer has come, those who believe in Him are partakers of the Abraham covenant of promise. We're all the seed of Abraham by faith in the finished work of Jesus Christ. That makes sense? Amen. Amen. Okay, so how do we use the law? You can read the law. When you're reading the law, you're really understanding what has been fulfilled in you, in your spirit already. You can read the law. I'll give you an example. I've used that example Tony Evans gives all the time. He said he was a kid and he wanted to be like Michael Jordan, but no matter how many books he read, he could never dunk a basketball. When you read this book, you will become more like Christ. This book inhabits you. This book changes you. And if you keep reading and meditating, thou shalt not kill, then for too long you ain't going to want to kill your neighbor because it will change you. Amen. But if you look at it, if you look at it backwards and say, thou shalt not kill and say, well, shoot, I can't kill my neighbor. I ain't going to heaven. It's a good idea for you not to kill your neighbor. But that ain't going to keep you out of heaven. The only thing that will keep you out of heaven is an absence of the substitute blood that Jesus offered on you or my behalf. That's the only thing to keep you out of heaven. You got great men in the Bible that committed murder, and they're with God right now because they believed God. I'm not uh, promoting violence, and I ain't promoting killing the people that you don't want. Hey, God will forgive me. I'll just go ahead and get them out of my life. I wouldn't do that because God will move your ministry from the church to the prison. He'll still use you, no doubt. Amen. Because He never leaves us or forsakes us, but it wouldn't be a good idea for you. But you can read the Bible, and we was talking about this in men's group the other night. When you read the Bible, it's your mirror. It shows you what God has already made you in your spirit. And when you learn what He's already made you in your spirit, what it is doing, it is influencing your soul. Now, once the influence of the relationship with God through your spirit begins to influence your mind, will, and emotions, what is your body going to do in response to what you think, feel? It's going to do exactly what your soul tells it to do, will it not? Does your body not do what your brain tells it to do? Raise my arm. My soul is communicating with my body and giving its ability to function. So through the influence of the spirit relationship, through this word, I'm causing myself to act right. Or Jesus is acting right uh, through me. Amen. Now verse 9 says, uh, let me flip back to where I was at. Verse 9 says, Knowing this, that the law is not made for a righteous man. You don't need the law any longer. You need a relationship with God, period. You're saved. As you communicate with Him, as you fellowship with Him, you're going to keep the law. There has never been in the history of time somebody that sinned while they were walking in the Spirit. It's never happened, nor will it ever happen, because your spirit you is perfect. I like, and it really changed my life when I understood what Paul was saying when he said, It's no longer I that sin, but sin that dwells in me. What he was saying was, I'm new and I don't sin. That's my old nature I'm still dealing with is sinning. But we had the ability through the relationship, through the correct process, through faith unfeigned, which causes a good conscience, which causes a charity out of the pure heart, which leads to the end of the commandment. We had the ability through that relationship to change the right way. Remember when Paul told the Galatians, Oh, you foolish Galatians, have you begun the Spirit now made perfect by flesh? You can't change in reverse. And you can't fulfill the law to have a love out of your pure heart to give you a good conscience to create faith. It don't work that way. It happens in reverse. But when we get a legalistic uh, mentality or a doctrine, that is exactly what we are trying to accomplish. Amen, amen, amen. And then if you ain't careful, there's a couple I've been witnessing to trying to get them to come to church. 
And finally, they told me why they didn't come. It's because they live together and are not married. Shame on the church. They said, see, we can't come to your church. We ain't married. I said, that is a bunch of baloney. Let me give you some advice. You probably need to get married. But you ain't got to be married to come down and hear about Jesus. Amen. You can come and fellowship with us. I don't care. Like if J.D. wore his boxers in, come on in. We'll go get some clothes for him. But he is welcome here. Somewhere down the line, the church has got so legalistic that we don't even let the people in that need Jesus. What in the world? And that's what Paul was preaching against here. If you ain't careful, you start treating your kids that way. If you ain't careful, you start treating your wife that way. And then you wonder why they never listen to you and never do what you say. It's because you're handing out the strength of sin to them. And you're giving them no grace. Imagine if all you had to live by was the law. You'd be a miserable human being. You'd be a failure. And you'd be on your way to hell because you can't do it. But I'm thankful today that when the law came, sin revived and I died and sin abounds. But grace did much more abound. Amen. So think about that every day in every action. Let me tell you something. If you ask God to teach you grace, he'll teach it to you. There'll be many times it won't be comfortable. But nonetheless, it'll be worth every second that you learn more about his grace. But you've got to be real careful. You can know it here. And then you're not walking in grace and you're really pushing people away from Christ. You're really causing people to rebel. And that's exactly what Paul was talking about here in verse 7. He says, Desire to be teachers of the law, understanding neither what they say nor whereof they affirm. They ain't got a clue what they're talking about. And they're giving people the ability and more ability and more ability to rebel, to rebel, to rebel. Amen. Y'all understand that? Any questions? Circle prayer.